All right, God. folks. Well, yeah, welcome to the Entheogenic Explorers podcast. I've got Dr. Martin Ball with me again. Uh, excited to have him. And uh, yeah, after the last podcast, we had a lot of folks just reach out and um, honestly just uh, say thank you for having him on. We had a lot of positive feedback. Um, it was good to see him out in, in the public again and sharing the information that he had. So I'm just really excited to have you back by demand. So you're back by popular demand. Um, I've got a few questions that folks wrote in that I said I'll try to get in in the course of the show. But um, yeah, I wanted to touch on uh, just briefly as we were talking before you came on the show, uh, before we started recording, excuse me, we we're talking about the event coming up uh, with the Church of Silomethoxin. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe that'd be a good way to, to, if you want to do a brief intro again, please do for the folks that are just starting or just meeting you and we can hop into that. All right. It's uh, great to be back here, Kirby. It's uh, nice to be invited to return to your show and talk about <clears throat> all of these things. So yeah, my name's Martin, and uh, it, you did introduce me as Dr. Martin Ball. And yeah, this is a, a great topic that I love to discuss, that I have my PhD in religious studies. Um, I'm also a self-identified, non-religious, non-spiritual person, um, and I ended up in religious studies because I wanted, initially, I wanted to study Buddhist philosophy, and that was the only place you could do it, was in a religious studies department. Um, but I did go on, I got my BA in philosophy, and I got my master's and my PhD in religious studies with an emphasis on um, comparative mysticism, shamanism, and also Native American religious traditions. So that's that's my official education is in that background. And so I've always been interested in the question of religion and entheogens. And as a student, I mostly had to make up my own curricula around that topic because it just wasn't something that was taught. And this is something that is now definitely shifting in the cultural landscape as we have various entheogenic churches and religions popping up and playing a more significant role within uh, modern American society. So I think it's it's something that hopefully uh, eventually, every religious studies department will have classes on entheogens and religion and have it be a primary area of study. And I think it's mm -hmm. going to need to be because the culture is changing so quickly and so rapidly. And so, yeah, so you yeah. mentioned the uh, the Church of Silomethoxin. And so for anybody who hasn't heard about this yet, um, this is something that's really brand new, which is um, in many different ways, it's brand new. So first of all, we have what is being called uh, silomethoxin. And this is an edible form of 5-MeO-DMT. And I'm not a mycologist, I'm not a scientist, so I can't speak to how any of this works at the magical um, mushroom biological level. But my basic understanding is that what has been done is that um, psilocybin mushrooms, before they go into the fruiting stage and create what we know of as a mushroom, that the, the mycelium is saturated with pure 5-MeO-DMT. So this is added into the mushroom substrate. And then as it turns into fruiting bodies, rather than producing psilocybin and psilocin, the mushrooms are, so they're not producing their own tryptamines, they're just using the tryptamines that have been introduced into the substrate, and they're converting it into 4-HO-5-MeO-DMT. And so with that ad addition of the hydroxylated group on the 4 position, it makes the 5-MeO-DMT edible. And now normally, 5-MeO-DMT, if it were taken orally, it would be broken down by enzymes in our stomach. It's the same thing with DMT. But if you have 4-HO-DMT, which is psilocybin, you can ingest it and you can have an experience. And so this is the same thing that's happening with the 5-MeO-DMT. So this is a brand new compound. And it's, it's interesting in that sense, because obviously, since it's brand new, there are no laws or regulations right. around it. And have you have you um, have you sampled this? And, and I guess maybe I shouldn't ask you that. But well, it's it's a legal substance. Is that oh, is it something oh, that you've? Yeah, I don't care. You can ask me about anything. Um, yes, I have that. I was actually sent 
a sample batch from the Church of Salem at Oxen. And um, it came in these forms of rather large capsules. And I've been able, I've had time. It does require time that it's about a five hour experience overall. Um, so it does require time. And so, you know, as a husband, father, uh, integration coach, uh, podcaster, you know, it's pretty rare that I have a block of five hours that I've got nothing else I'm going to do now. So I've tried a few low dose experiments with it and also did one that I would consider a high dose. And that actually was only about 1.2 grams, maybe. Um, but in my experience, um, from the phenomenological side that my estimate is that they're about three times as potent as regular psilocybin mm -hmm. mushrooms. So you're working with a lower amount and you're getting a bigger experience. And sure. it, in my impression, it definitely was an oral form of 5-MeO DMT. Um, I will say that there has been um, some disagreement within the psychedelic uh, and scientific community that um, apparently some people claim that they have tested psilomethoxin mushrooms and they have, and they say that it doesn't have psilomethoxin in it, but it has, um, uh, psilocin. And I don't know if these have, are mushrooms that have been tested that came from the church of psilomethoxin or not. So I, I really don't know on that end of things, but I can just say experientially for me, um, it seemed uh, very distinct and uh, not at all psilocybin mushrooms and yeah. appeared as a form of edible 5-MeO-DMT. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah so... I, I, I've been working with it for about three months now in, in, in microdose form uh, uh, initially. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I could, same thing, I did hear that report and I did a larger dose, uh, maybe maybe five to six times of, of my microdose. So, I, you know, again, I think the equivalent was maybe one, one and a half grams, which seems like an, a, a, a comfortable entry point as you're, as you're working with a new medicine. And I felt for sure, I'm like, I don't know who, I for sure could tell the difference. It didn't feel like psilocybin. I felt that, um, I was explaining to my wife, it definitely felt like the default mode network was dulled down. My thoughts were stopped. Usually on a psilocybin journey, it's the, it it's, could be the looping thoughts, the, yeah. the, 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 the I was just silent. I'm like, this is distinctly different. So I thought it was distinctly different as well. Yeah. So that's what we in the field call the bioassay, right? That you have to, in order to really test something, you got to take it in, see what kind of experience you get. So yeah. to go um, further, that um, there is now this church of Silomethoxin. So this is a church that has been formed um, by Greg and Jenna Lake, recently married, congratulations, and Ian Benwee. And both Greg and Ian are lawyers who work in the area of religious freedom protections. And they're particularly interested in creating legal access to entheogenic experience within a quote unquote sacred context of being a church. And so they've created this, this governing body of the church. And it is not a physical place or location because it's more of an online thing. And also they're highly driven to get um, psychedelic therapy access to vets and in a way that is relatively cheap and relatively accessible. Um, obviously, there's been a big push recently for getting vets access to psychedelic therapy via psilocybin and MDMA, but that's through um, psychedelic assisted therapy. And so, for example, that's something that uh, passed legally here in Oregon. We voted on it a couple of years ago to create a psilocybin assisted therapy program. And just last week, uh, one of the main groups that was organizing training of facilitators, which was located here in Ashland, Oregon, went bankrupt and all the students lost their money, their courses not complete. And so there are no, there are currently no uh, psychedelic assisted therapy qualified individuals in Oregon. And then once it does once we actually get through and actually have people who have been certified and qualified, which I have questions about anyway, but anyway, um, it's going to be extremely expensive. And so this idea of, well, we're going to have this program and vets with PTSD, they can use this program. It's going to cost thousands of dollars. This is not going to be covered by insurance. So going back to the church of Salomethoxin, 
they are making this quote unquote sacrament available and they're really promoting it among veterans so that they can get access to this, which again, there are no laws uh, around its use. They can use it at home, they can microdose and they can self treat their own PTSD, depression and anxiety um, at a cost that is way, way below what yes. the quote unquote legal therapy is going to provide. Um, so it's a big part of their, their mission. And to help galvanize people around all of this, they are hosting an event that is exactly one month from today. It's going to be April 15th. It's being held in Austin, Texas, and they're calling it Entheogenesis. And they've invited a number of people to come and speak on a variety of different topics. And they're also going to be having um, like a sacrament-based ecstatic dance um, to top off the day. And um yeah, they invited me to come out and speak at the event and they're flying me out. And I'm, I'm really excited to be participating yeah. in that. And they invited me to talk about um, the impact of music on a theogenic experience and also be available for a Q&A. So that'll be, you know, whatever people want to talk about. Yeah, no, that's that's exciting. Um, it's been interesting just watching them and watching the evolution of them. I know Chuck Crisco, I think, if I hope I said that right, Chuck, um, he's somebody we're trying to get on the podcast. So maybe this will be the, the shoe in on it. But um, yeah, they do a, a church service on Sunday. Um, it's interesting yeah. because, again, the legality of it. Um, and again, I could cheer some of us, a, a lot of folks know that follow us. I mean, the unchurched church, we're the first, my understanding through our attorney, the first DMT church. There's been ayahuasca churches and there's been uh, other, uh, you know, five MEO churches, but accessibility to all of those has always been a, a, a sticky point because like you said, it's a sacrament, but understanding that not everybody could inhale smoke, right? And not yeah. everybody could ingest ayahuasca. So we have to have accessibility in multiple forms. So just having one just seemed kind of silly, but um, so it's interesting that they're, they formatted that way because it is a legal substance. Is the church just uh, like an additional protective shell, do you know, or is it um, to, you know, create a, a uh, an environment that shows it is more of a, 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 a sacrament and it should be taken sacred? Yeah, now, I think ultimately... Thoughts? Um, you know, I can't speak for the Church of Asylum of Thoughts, and so that would be a question that you'd really need to address to them. But yes, I, I think as an outsider um, who is, you know, only mildly participating in, in what they're doing, um, is that they are looking to create these legal protections above and beyond just the fact that um, this is a novel substance. Because of course, as we all know, Congress gets the uh, drug warrior be in their bonnet every once in a while and is like, okay, well, what are what else can we make illegal? What else can we shut off access to? Um, mm -hmm. And so even if they decided to do that with silomethoxin, that this would be another layer of protection sure. um, because of what happened back in the 1990s with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, um, which is something that I, I am very comfortable talking about. Um, but yeah, I think that they also want to provide a social context in which people can meet up. And, you know, the format is all online. So the idea is that they're actually creating kind of a global community um, of making this uh, sacrament accessible. And they are, um, in, a, in a sense, what they're doing is they're making it available by a set donation. So you make a donation to the church and their funds, uh, what they raise in terms of profit, they're using to support, I think it's called Warriors of Light. I could be incorrect on that, but it's about supporting veterans and getting them access to uh, proper mental health care. Um, and so you make a donation to the church and then they send you the sacrament in the mail. And the, it's not restricted by border, that there are no laws anywhere in the world around silomethoxin. So um, there's these various workarounds, but they want to provide the context and then also have the Sunday church services um, to give reaffirming messages and to provide that sense of community and that sense of communion that comes from gathering with like-minded people. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's, I, I, I like what they're doing. And, and, and you brought up a, a good piece. Um, we're out here in Iowa, we mentioned earlier, we're trying to pass some uh, psilocybin reform. And uh, one of the representatives, uh, Shipley, um, he was actually had Greg Lake's book with him. He was walking around as we were doing this with Greg Lake's book. Um, and he was talking, I think one of the best avenues moving forward is through the Religious uh, Freedom and Restoration Act. In, in, in that sense, 
Um, but then it goes back. So we can talk about that because that's a, a piece we were tapping on earlier. I just find it fascinating. There's a lot of churches like ours and the Church of Southern Oxen and some of the a lot of other churches that are set up under this uh, Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Give us the overview on that. Yeah, so um, I'll actually, uh, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in going all the way into the history of it. Um, okay. So we can start with Native American cultures, okay? So at the time of European contact between, you know, your Christopher Columbus, the dude, and um, indigenous cultures in North America, there were some 500 different distinct cultures. And they all had their own languages, they all had their own traditions, they had their own mythologies, they had their own practices, their own rituals. And while there were um, kind of larger cultural groupings, each culture was very much distinct from each other. So for example, I did my field work research for my PhD with the Mescalero Apache tribe. And so everybody's familiar with the term Apache. You know, we've got Apache helicopters. We have, everybody knows that Apaches are a tribe, but they're not actually a tribe. There are multiple distinct Apache cultures. So there's Mescalero culture, there's Chiricahua Apaches, there's Hickorya Apaches, there's San Carlos Apaches, there are White Mountain Apaches, and there are Lepan. Uh, Apaches. So there's all these different cultural groups of Apaches, and they share certain things in common with each other. They all speak different dialects of the Apache language, and they're not necessarily mutually intelligible to each other because they are very much different dialects. It's the same way as you could take someone with a thick Scottish brogue and put it together with a Texan, and they wouldn't know what the fuck they were saying to each other. Okay. Um, so even among the Apaches, there was a great deal of diversity and um, they shared certain elements in common, but some of the cultures were actually rather distinct from each other. So within Apache culture, the Lapan Apaches are the only group of Apaches that indigenously made use of peyote and no other Apache groups ever ate peyote or used that for religious or spiritual purposes. But anyway, we've got these wide diversity of cultures. And um, within these different cultures, the, some of them made use of entheogenic plants and substances. And so some of these would be like up around the Great Lakes regions. We have the Ojibwe cultures, which again, there's a variety of different Ojibwe's. And some of them made use of Amanita muscara mushroom as part of the Grand Medicine Society, the Mediwinwin. And then when you get into the Southwest of what is now the United States, um, actually the most commonly used entheogenic substance was not peyote at all, uh, which grows in Texas and in Northern Mexico, um, but there was widespread use of datura. And the use of datura extended all the way from Texas through New Mexico, Arizona, and on into Southern California. And this was the primary visionary substance that was used by these cultures. And then as we go up the uh, Northwest coast on into um, Canada and Alaska, these were also places where the Amanita mascara mushroom was used. And then throughout the Great Plains in that region, um, there is historical evidence that these cultures made use of what is called the mescal bean, which is this little, little bean, very hard shelled bean that varies from kind of a golden orange color to red to a very deep purple. And um, this is said to be a very potent and also very toxic psychedelic compound. And that um, if overused, it would produce uh, death. And so this was called the red bean cult. And um, is actually so dangerous that for example, if you go into the Southwest today, you can find a lot of indigenous cultures, Native American cultures that use the red mescal bean in their jewelry and in their ceremonial adornment, but they don't ever actually consume it because they know that it's actually quite dangerous. So within the indigenous cultures of the Americas, um, or North America, I should say, there was use of various entheogens, but peyote was not primary. Again, it was like the Lapan Apaches, they used peyote. And then as we get down into what is now Mexico, um, the use of peyote is far more common. So 
when white Christians came from Europe over to the Americas, a common assessment that was made, and I think even I think even Christopher Columbus himself said this in his writings back to um, Europe, was that, oh, these people here have no religion whatsoever. They are primed for conversion to Christianity because they they don't have religion. Now, what Christopher Columbus and other European explorers meant was these people, they don't have any churches. They don't have some holy book. And you know what? They don't know about Jesus. So they don't have religion. They have ceremonies. They have rituals. They have these cultural practices, but they don't have what we call religion. And so then with the formation of the United States and this idea that we have freedom of religion, this was not extended to Native Americans in any way, shape, or form because Native Americans didn't have religion. They just had these cultural practices. So it was actually through the formation of the reservation system, um, Native Americans were prohibited from practicing their indigenous religious practices. And because it was all under the guise of security, right? One of the, of the, the modern security information state that, um, you know, if they dance, to, if, the, if the natives dance too much, they're going to get all riled up and they're going to want to go to war. So we're not going to let them do it. And actually, um, the, the administration of the reservations was all turned over to Christian missionaries. And so it was just divided among Christian groups like, okay, well, you guys get the Apaches, you get the Navajo, you get the Comanche, you get the Ojibwe. And, you know, it was all divided that way. And of course, there were boarding schools that were created and the indigenous children were stolen from their cultures. And they were basically force fed a very militant form of Christianity within these boarding schools. Um, and in order to be fair, I guess, uh, the United States government said, well, indigenous cultures can practice their cultural practices one day out of the year, but it must fall on a recognized U.S. holiday. So for example, out at Mescalero, again, where I was doing my field work, um, their main religious tradition is the girl's initiation ceremony when a girl reaches puberty she goes through a very elaborate ritual procedure and mostly they would do those uh ceremonies in spring and in summer so at mescalero they decided that the fourth of july was the closest date of a u.s holiday around their normal ritual calendar so that became their quote-unquote feast day was july 4th so anyway, this is all just background so that we can get to what is the Native American church. So uh, as I've been discussing, all of the indigenous practices of these Native American cultures were whitewashed, Christianized, and um, access to indigenous traditions themselves was made fundamentally impossible by the, the structures of the reservation system and the U.S. government. And of course, religious freedom was not granted to Native Americans. So then, in the late 1800s, a Comanche by the name of Quana Parker, uh, I, I'm not sure of all the details of the story, but I think what happened was that he got wounded, and then, um, you know, this is in battles with the United States, and he ended up actually over the border in Mexico, and there a Mexican curandera treated him with peyote. And then he became what is kind of known as the prophet of the what was first called the peyote cult and then eventually became the native american church and there was an ethnologist at the time whose name was james mooney so this was you know a white american dude i think he was working for the smithsonian i could be wrong about that so don't quote me on that um but he was an ethnographer and an ethnographer is a little bit different than an anthropologist and that an ethnographer goes out into the field and their job is I'm just going to describe and document what these people think and what they're doing. I'm not trying to analyze it in any way. So he started documenting the rise of this quote unquote peyote cult. And he kind of teamed up with Quanta Parker. And um, the peyote cult itself became a substitute for indigenous religious traditions. So in other words, with these highly disrupted cultures, 
And uh, keep in mind that there was lots of relocation that was taking place. So native cultures were taken from where they were and they were transplanted hundreds or thousands of miles away. Most Native American religious traditions are intimately tied to their ecological home base. So for example, if the bison is a sacred symbol in your culture, getting transplanted to Southern Florida, that's gonna fuck with your religion because there's no bison in Southern Florida. And that's what happened to a lot of native cultures, okay? So anyway, this became what was called pan-Indian religion. And also at this time, pretty much all Native Americans had been proselytized with Christianity. So the early formation of the peyote cult actually combined elements of Christianity with indigenous traditions and the use of peyote and so anyway, James Mooney said to Quanah Parker, hey, the U.S. government doesn't recognize Native cultures as having religion or even having religious rights. But if we were to incorporate this as a church, then the United States government will have to recognize you as an official religion and you'll have rights to practice this peyote religion. So that's where we get the Native American church, that this was actually created in conjunction with the ethnologist James Mooney specifically to guarantee these religious freedom rights. So it's kind of echoes of what's happening today, sure. right? And then the Native American church started to quickly spread among indigenous cultures throughout North America and all the way on up into Canada. Again, these were cultures that had been highly disrupted, did not have access to their indigenous traditions, had been Christianized. So the idea of, oh, I'm going to go into the teepee, which was used among Plains cultures. It wasn't ubiquitous. You know, not, every, not all Native Americans lived in teepees, people. Um, and teepee itself is a Lakota word. So specifically, if we're talking about teepees, we're talking about Lakota Native Americans. That's their word for it. Um, but anyway, it quickly spread among these different cultures. And the idea was, well, if I can go into a teepee and eat peyote and commune with Jesus, cool. And this is protected. I can do this. Whereas my indigenous cultures, I can only practice one day out of the year, which is pretty fucked up. Um, and so that was the formation of the Native American church. Okay, so I'll take a pause. Do you have any questions about that? Anything I can have used today before Actually, I jump on to the next layer of the story? Lesson. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it's an important lesson too because you're touching on some, some just, again, I think when folks think of like the Native American church or they just assume that that's just the fact, I could just end it with this, 500 different tribes practicing different forms of different religions. So just... Folks need to keep that in mind. I think, like you said, we, I think when you say indigenous people, sometimes folks have a tendency just to have one vision of that. That's the teepee, that's the plains, that's the peyote, but it's, that, that is, that's not the case by a long shot. Yeah. And it's really important to recognize that in the formation of the church, this was something that was brand new. This was not some ancient indigenous tradition that dates back hundreds or thousands of years. It's not the wisdom right. of the ancestors. It's nothing like that. It's brand new. This had never existed before in Native American culture north of the Mexican border, aside from the Lapan Apaches, okay? And they did not practice the Native American church. They used peyote in conjunction with their Apache religious practices. So it was something totally, completely, 100% different. So this is, right. this is a brand new religion that is invented in combination with a Native American prophet, Quanah Parker, and an ethnologist working for the Smithsonian Institution. Again, I'm not certain about that, so I might be making that up. Sorry if I, if I made that up. Anyways, we can now fast forward um, about 100 years or so, okay? So now, what we get in, I think it was 1990, and it happened here in Oregon. So by this point, the Native American church had kind of spread all throughout North America, including Canada. And here in Oregon, we have this guy Smith, who works for, I think it's the Department of Public Works or something like that. He has some kind of government job um, in Oregon. And he's a member of the Native American church. 
And so I'm just kind of recounting this in story form. I don't have all the details, but my understanding is that his boss knew that he was part of the Native American church. So by this time in 1990, we have the war on drugs started uh, basically back in like 1975 with Richard Nixon, who wanted to get the hippies and he wanted to get the leftists. And so he's like, okay, let's make drugs illegal and then we can bust these guys. And that's when all research into psychedelic substances stopped and, um, also, then everything became illegal, including peyote. And then also the United States signed the UN Declaration um, Against Illegal Drugs. And so it joined this um, treaty that all the member countries of the United Nations will work to end the illegal drug trade and, and use and abuse of illegal drug substances. So anyway, this guy's boss says, what are you going to do this weekend? And Brown says, well, I'm going to go to church. And he said, well, are you going to eat peyote? He said, yes, that's my religion. And his boss said, that's an illegal drug. If you do that, you're fired and you don't, and you're going to lose all your benefits. And the guy said, well, it's my religion. So he went and did it. And then he comes back on a Monday and his boss said, did you go to church? He says, yes, I did. Did you eat peyote? Yes, I did. Okay, you're fired. So this ends up becoming a court case and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And it's under the question of, what is religious freedom and where, how do we balance the interests of the state versus the interests of religious practitioners? Yeah. So at the time, the, the majority of opinion and the Supreme Court was written by Justice Anton Scalia. And I can go ahead and read you uh, his uh, conclusion. He says, it is a permissible reading of the free exercise clause to say that if prohibiting the exercise of religion is not the object of the law, but merely the incidental effect of a generally applicable and otherwise valid provision, the First Amendment has not been offended, the First Amendment being the free exercise of religion. To make an individual's obligation obey such a law contingent upon the law's coincidence with his religious beliefs, except where the state's interest is, quote, compelling, permitting him by virtue of his beliefs to become a law unto himself, contradicts both constitutional tradition and common sense. To adopt a true compelling interest requirement for laws that affect religious practice would lead towards anarchy. So to tussle out what he's saying here, what he's saying is that, look, okay, peyote is an illegal drug. Mescaline is an illegal drug. And the United States created this law not to hamper anyone's ability to um, participate in the Native American church. In other words, we're not targeting you. We're not making a law against your religion. But this, we have a compelling interest to make peyote illegal because it's dangerous and bad. And he says that, well, if, if we were to carve out exceptions to the law, because a law that was not intended to target your religion prohibits you from enacting your religion, that that would just be total anarchy. Because then anyone could come forward and say, hey, it's my religion that I can use this illegal drug or I can do this quote unquote illegal thing. It, that's my religious belief. And the First Amendment grants me freedom to exercise my religion the way I see fit. So what Scalia ended up saying was that, look, the way we're going to come down on this is that he says, actually, the First Amendment does not protect the practice of religion. What it protects is your right to believe whatever the fuck you want to believe. So if you believe peyote is a divine sacrament, making peyote illegal does not compromise your belief in any way, shape, or form. But we're still going to bust you if you go and use it. Because what you do, that falls under this idea of, well, this is a generally applicable law and you're breaking the law, no exceptions. Okay. So in other words, um, this guy who went to the Native American church and ate peyote, he was not granted any kind of religious freedom rights. And is like, well, look, yeah, you can believe that. And then you're practicing your, your religion. So this even shows that there is a deep bias in American culture around the idea that religion is what you believe, which is uh, 
very culturally specific interpretation of what religion is. Like you could go to any of these Native American cultures, these 500 cultures that we talked about and ask them, is your religion what you believe? And they would all answer, no, it's what we do. It's the songs that we sing. It's the stories that we tell us, the rituals that we perform. It's the prayers that we do. This is not about what we believe. This is about what we do as a culture and how it shapes our identity. So trying to identify religion based on belief is a culturally biased perspective. And it doesn't hold up once we start doing cross-cultural comparisons of right. what religion is. So anyway, this was the Supreme Court decision, which basically said, guess what? Everyone who's a member of the Native American church, we can go and arrest you. If you go to church and eat peyote, the feds are coming for you. What the response was to this is actually quite interesting. Congress freaked out about this because they said, well, that means that actually nobody's religious practices are protected. Right. And that's not our reading of the First Amendment, of the free exercise. I mean, what is the free exercise of religion if it doesn't involve what you do? It doesn't say yeah. Yeah. in the Constitution, it doesn't say what you believe. It says the, the exercise of religion, which seems to imply what you do to some capacity. So this then prompted in 1993 for Congress to write the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And I think it was signed into law by Bill Clinton in 1994. And what they did was say, um, they weren't specifically looking to address the question of entheogens and psychedelics and how it applies to drug laws, but they were looking at this case of the Native American church. And so what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act says that if you have a religious practice that is impeded by a law that has been made by the state, you can petition the government for exemption from the application of that law in order for you to practice your religion. So this opens the door for um, uh, underrepresented cultures and religions to say, hey, I know you have a law against this, but actually this is my religion, this is my tradition, and so can we, can we get an exemption to that? And then um, shortly after the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, there was another one made specifically called the Native American Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which not only looked at um, the question of peyote in the Native American church, but also how religions were treated on the reservation system and this whole classification that, no, you have cultural rituals and practices, you don't have an actual religion, um, so that, that Native Americans could claim religious freedom in other ways uh, as well, not just with peyote. And so that act was specifically made for Native Americans. And what it did is it also, it's, it's the only racially biased religion law in the United States, because what it ended up doing was saying that if you have a certain amount of ancestry as a Native American, you and only you can legally participate in the Native American church. Anybody else, you can't. You have to be Native American to eat peyote legally and to possess it and to transport it. Um, and then the states were able to make their own adjustments to that. So for example, here in Oregon, they also passed, passed a Religious Freedom Restoration Act that said, we don't care what your race is. Anybody can go to the Native American church and eat peyote and your religious freedom is protected. So that's the history on that. And I, I've got more, but I'll pause because I'm talking a lot. I mean, I'm keeping you no, quiet. This, this is actually great. Um, so I guess... Where where is that putting churches at today? Like specifically, um, like some of the ayahuasca churches. How did that come about? So now again, we have some native ayahuasca churches that have kind of created the precedent for other ayahuasca churches, and, and now kind of the behind the scenes thing is, um, I've got colleagues that are trying to join these churches, so then they can legally do it just based on your point where they've made it um, specific to certain groups, and uh, and we've got a mess as it seems. Yeah, it's, Explain it's still this a mess. It's, it still <laughs> is a mess. Um, so then here we can now divert into what was happening outside of Native American cultures. So um, 
you know, as we know that the consumption of psychedelics can lead to very deep and profound spiritual and quote unquote religious experiences, whether you are part of a church or a religion or not, that this is one of the side effects of taking psychedelics. Uh, you know, it's just to come with a warning. Uh, you may have a deep spiritual experience and a complete perspective change of the nature of reality. Um, so one of the things that happened uh, as kind of an outgrowth of the 1960s is um, some people wanted to create churches around, say, the use of LSD. Um, so there was a, a group in California that tried to create, I think it was called the Church of the Light. I, I'm, I'm not certain of what the name was for it, but it actually ended up before uh, a judge in a court case. And what they were arguing was, and this was before the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, they said, look, this is our religion. We want to take LSD, and that's how we worship God. And the judge said, well, there is no history of such use. So there's no right. longstanding religious tradition. And white people have never used drugs for religion, which we has now historically know is completely false and inaccurate and wrong. But back in the 70s, no one had been researching this yet. So we didn't know that actually most Western religion uh, has roots in, in theogenic experience. Um, going back to the ancient Greeks and even further back into uh, ancient Egypt, um, so we now know that that's a bullshit argument. You can't say, well, white people have never done it. Um, yeah. Not true. But anyway, he said there's no longstanding religious belief here. And we actually, we, the court, we do not believe that you have a sincere religious belief. In other words, this is just an excuse for you to get high, fucking hippies. So denied. So then things changed with the introduction of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, because suddenly now here is not only historical precedent around the Native American church, but there is an argument that you can make that, look, if this is my sincere religious belief, but it's still hinged on the idea of belief and my sincere religious practice, then uh, I should get an exemption. So the first non-Native testing of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in regards to entheogenic religions comes via an imported religion that comes from Brazil. It's called the Union do Vegetal. And the Union do Vegetal means the union of the plants. So here we're talking about ayahuasca. And this is not a widely practiced religion in the United States. Um, there's only small groups of people, and actually it's not even a largely practiced religion in Brazil. It's a rather small, but this is kind of a combination of Catholicism with the use of ayahuasca as a sacrament. And so there was a small group of, it's called the UDV uh, yeah. for short. Um, there was a small group of UDV practitioners in, I believe it was New Mexico, and they call ayahuasca huasca. They don't call it ayahuasca, just huasca. Uh, or Hoska, and their shipment got seized at the border. And the government, the DEA said, oh, this is uh, ayahuasca. It contains DMT. DMT is a legal drug. Therefore, you don't get your waska. And so they filed a Religious Freedom Restoration Act petition against the government. And the court went all the, uh, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And it is my understanding that the Supreme Court didn't necessarily side with the UDV, but they also said, um, well, U.S. government, um, there is now the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And yeah, we didn't agree with it in the first place the, before it was written. But now that it's written and it's the law that actually the, we do need to allow for exceptions. And this is clearly one of those cases. So your case is kind of junk. And so they sent it back down. Um, they said, the, if you want to relitigate this in the lower courts, you can do that. But your argument coming to the Supreme Court, U.S. government, it doesn't hold any water. There's no substance here. So ultimately, the DEA gave the WASCA back to the UDV folks, and they were able to drink it. And so they're continuing to do that. So that was the first test of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, in regards to non-Indigenous use of entheogens. Um, the next case also happened here in Oregon. So Oregon is a testing ground for all of this stuff. So another religion that comes from Brazil that is a, it's called a syncretic religious tradition. Now this is important because um, the Native American church is a syncretic religious tradition, meaning it combines elements of native indigenous religion and also Christianity. 
it's combined together. Um, the UDV combines Catholicism with the use of ayahuasca, and also the, the Santo Daime religion yeah. combines Catholicism with drinking of ayahuasca. So it's a syncretic religious tradition. And so all three of these religions have elements of Christianity built into them. And so that's one of the ways that this has been analyzed, that if you can actually combine some Christianity into your entheogenic religion, the courts are more likely to side with you. But anyway, um, this is a much larger, much more commonly practiced religion that comes out of Brazil. And it was started by a black rubber tapper who was in the jungles of Brazil. And uh, he got hurt and he was... Um, given some ayahuasca. And according to the story, he had a vision of the queen of the forest came to him and told him that uh, white Europeans had completely fucked up the message of Jesus. So it hid itself in the ayahuasca vine and was now ready to come back out into the world through the form of ayahuasca, which he renamed daime, which in Portuguese means give me, and it means give me light, give me health, uh, give me happiness. And um, that this is the true teachings of Jesus. Um, so anyway, there are what are called points of the Santo Daime religion. They don't call them churches, they call them points. And there's a point here in Ashland, Oregon. And this is actually led by someone who is um, uh, culturally, uh, he was Jewish. Um, it is also acupuncturist, and he ended up studying with some of what are called the maestros in Brazil about the Santo Daime religion. So he brought it here to Ashland, Oregon, and created the Church of the Holy Light of the Queen. And so they drink ayahuasca. And um, this was actually right around the time that I moved to Ashland, Oregon. And I started participating in the Church of the Holy Light of the Queen that they decided we are going to sue the federal government for our religious freedom rights, that we're going to take the government to court and we're going to argue that our drinking of ayahuasca, even though it is in violation of the drug laws, is religiously protected. Um, now, there was negotiations that were made even prior to the case coming to court, which I think are very significant. One was that they set up, the government demanded that, that they set up the fiction that there are only points of the Santo Daime Church in Oregon. And we're gonna pretend that there aren't points anywhere else in the United States, which is a complete fiction because there are. Because what they wanted to do is say, okay, so you guys in Oregon, you're bringing your case to us, but if you get your religious freedom, we're only going to apply it in the state of Oregon, not anywhere else. And then they also had to create what I consider to be another fiction of distinguishing, saying daime is not ayahuasca. Daime is daime because we pray for it and we prepare it in a way that injects the spirit of Joramidan into the ayahuasca, which makes it daime. It is not ayahuasca. And the reason that they had to make this distinction is because here in Southern Oregon, there is lots of ayahuasca that is served. Uh, probably any given weekend, you could go out into the woods here and you could find an ayahuasca ceremony taking place. And so what they wanted to do was distinguish and make, create this, this legal fiction yeah. that an ayahuasca ceremony is a cultural ritual that is not religious in nature and therefore has no protections and no exemptions. But what they do in the Santo Daime church, that's real religion with real sincere religious beliefs. And their ayahuasca isn't actually ayahuasca, so it's daime. And um, they took this case to court. It was in 2008 and 2009, and they won. And so this is what then set the groundwork. It laid the foundation to open up this idea of um, actually, we can sue the government and we can win. And again, it, the UDV, they kind of won by default because the, the Supreme Court said, government, I think your argument is shit. Um, go back and relitigate it in the lower courts. But here um, in the federal court in Oregon, 
that the Santo Daime uh, definitively won. They were granted their religious freedom exemption, and they had already earned that from the state of Oregon prior to earning it from the federal government. So it's the only religion that has been tried in court um, that definitively won, but you can only legally drink Daime in Oregon at the moment. So um, that's how that came down. That's that's super interesting history too, because um, again, I think that just based on what you're saying, it probably did lay the found the foundation and the and, and for where we are today with churches all over the country. Um, one that's um, probably garnered some attention in the last probably few years has been Soul Quest, which is yeah. a church down in Florida. Um, and just a little bit again. I'll do my best. Um, research at your own. Um, my understanding is again the they've been all, they've attempted to shut them down several times, but they continue to plead their case and say this is religious freedom. Um, and it's been three years, and it seems that they're having a tough time getting them shut down for a reason. And the thought behind that to me would be again, what is what is a religion, right? So what. It's, Christianity is that is that it is that is that that it if it's Christian we'll call it a religion and we'll let you move forward or Islam but anything outside of that is 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 not working and I think that they're gonna I think that they're finding that that's a very difficult case to argue and win yeah so it, it's great to return to this question because as someone who comes from a religious studies background um, that there was a time within the discipline of religious studies where various scholars were trying to present what they considered to be um, some kind of universal definition of what is a religion. Um, and, you know, they, they were making good attempts at that, uh, trying to be as culturally inclusive as possible, trying to be not based on, because, you know, formerly the idea was, you know, among Christians, the idea was Christianity is a real religion. Everything else is paganism or false. Okay. Right. So they don't even qualify regardless of what they practice. Um, and so that, that definition was slowly opened up more and more and more, but basically the view among scholars of religion, and also keep in mind that originally the study of religion was all done by religious people. And then it became a more and more secular enterprise so that people like myself, who is not religious, become interested in studying religion. But originally it was more everybody, they had their um, degree in divinity studies. Those were the ones who were creating the discipline of religious studies. But it, all of these definitions of religion that were put out there ultimately have been critiqued as being too limiting, too narrow, too culturally biased, often in unconscious ways. So now, the, the more common position that you would find in religious studies is the idea of, look, we're not going to provide a definition of religion because we can't. Any definition that we give a religion is going to be culturally biased in one way or another, often in unconscious ways that we're not even perceiving or aware of. So rather, what we're doing within religious studies is we are focusing on the, des the description of, okay, well, people over here, this is their religion. We're going to describe it to you. We're not going to define, we're not going to say why it fits the definition of religion because we can't actually define what makes something a religion or not. And we also can't define like, so in the United States law, they've really focused on, on this idea of sincere religious belief. Okay, and then we want to use that as a standard for is this a real religion or not. So that's where, you know, there have, again, there have been other groups that have tried to create like a cannabis church, and the courts say, you, you fucking hippies, you just want to get high. This is just an excuse. This is not a sincere religious belief. Um, but then we also have the case of the flying spaghetti monster, which actually has been accepted as a legitimate religion, which is a parody religion. And so no one in the church of the flying spaghetti monster has a sincere religious belief that the flying spaghetti monster actually is God and is control of the universe. But that is the central doctrine of their church. Okay, so the, this focusing on belief is just way too limiting. And when we have scholars of religion telling you, we can't define what religion is, all we can do is describe it, what people say their religion is. What we have in its place, what's taking place within American society right now is the DEA itself 
becomes the arbiter of what qualifies as a religion. And the drug enforcement, no one in the federal government is qualified to make a determination over what is or is not an actual religion. There is not a single individual who is qualified to do that. Because as I've said, even scholars, even people with PhDs in religious studies like me, I will tell you, we cannot define what is religion. We can describe it to you, but we can't define it. So no one in the DEA, no one in the court system, no federal judge, no one anywhere has the ability to define what qualifies as religion or not. And so this, when we get to the SoulQuest case, what they've tried to do is they've tried to say, well, hey, SoulQuest, first of all, we went to your church and we asked people, what are the central teachings of your church? What do you believe? We want to know what are your, what are your sincere religious beliefs? And everybody gave them a different answer. So they said, oh, this is clearly not a religion because everybody gave a different answer. Now, I would just challenge the DEA, go into any church or religious body anywhere in the world and ask 20 different people, what is your religion? And I guarantee you, you will be getting different answers. You're not going to get some cookie cutter, everyone says the exact same thing. So it's, it's an absurd test to use against an entheogenic church. Then also they said, your church Actually, you promote that this is a church, but then you talk about people coming and getting healing. So actually, we think that you're talking about some kind of therapeutic process and healing isn't religion. And even right there, it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, look at Christianity in the United States, whether we've had charismatic churches, faith healing churches, laying on of hands, speaking in tongues, um, you know, Christian science religion that says Jesus is, is the true doctor and you just got to pray your whatever it is away. Even Buddhism itself, one of the names for the Buddha is the, the master physician. He is the master doctor because he is bringing the cure to your egoic ailments that are causing you the disease of attachment. Um, so it's completely fabricated to say that, well, if, if you're group promotes healing versus a strict set of beliefs that you're not a religion. I mean, it's, it's absolutely a facetious argument. It just doesn't hold any water whatsoever, but that's what the DEA did with SoulQuest. So it's still kind of up in the air that um, what SoulQuest did is that they actually tried that the DEA has under no one's authority created guidelines for if you want to get religious exemption, um, you have to fulfill these requirements. The DEA does not have the authority to create that. Congress, only Congress has the authority to do that, but the DEA just went and did it anyway. And then they're trying to make people jump through these hoops. And so that's what SoulQuest has been trying to do. And the DEA has been saying, no, you're not making it. Um, but they haven't gone in and shut it down and busted it because I think this I mean, I don't have any evidence to, to support this other than just my general impression is that um, because the government has lost all the cases so far when it comes to religious exemption around the use of psychedelics, that they haven't actually wanted to bust them and take them to court because they're going to lose. They're absolutely going to lose. Yeah. And um, selfishly, I've been rooting for that case because um, you do the math on SoulQuest. I'm, I'm pretty confident they've got a pretty good war chest. Yeah. So th they would be the ones, right, of anybody in the country because they are so public and well known and they've got a lot of traffic that goes through that center. They've got the war chest versus a lot of these smaller churches that are just, again, providing for you know just a handful of people. They don't have the, the financial backing to take on that type of case. Um, but I think SoulQuest does. So there's a lot of us out here that are, are, are watching that very closely for all the reasons you mentioned. And I can't agree with you more. If they had a case, they've They'd have done it already years yeah. ago. Um, they keep attempting, and it seems more like a bluff. And Soul Quest is like, nope, not doing it. And the DA is like, darn it, right? Like we tried, they didn't, they didn't bite, right? So yeah. it's like it feels like empty threats. Um, so I'm curious to see how that plays out. So I guess what's what's your take? What's the future of this? Well, I think the future. Yeah. Well, I, I think that we're seeing the future is happening right now with people like yourself, the Church of Salamethoxin, and a wide variety of other people is that, you know, they're reading the law, they're looking at the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, they're looking at this use of exemptions from drug laws, and using this as a workaround to help people gain access 
to psychedelic experience and entheogenic experience. And I think at this point, you know, the proverbial cat is out of the bag that, see, once we make an exemption for one, you can't really justify not making exemptions for others. And um, the exemption was made for the Native American church. And, and like I said, it's important to recognize that the Native American church does not have a lineage and history. It was something that was created. It was brand new. And so now for the courts to say, well, there, there's no history of this, that you're a brand new church and you don't have some long standing lineage or history, which the UDV do have. It's not that long. It's and, and the Santo Daime, they have a lineage. It's not all that long. It's less than 100 years old, both of those. Um, that that argument is kind of out. Um, that we can actually say, no, this is a new church. This is a, a, something new. No, it doesn't have any precedent before it, but that doesn't mean it can't be new. Um, and, you know, Christians have been doing that in the United States for a couple hundred years now. There are many forms of Christianity that were invented in the United States. They did not exist before. Um, and there's been a, a wide variety of other non-Christian religions that have been invented in the United States. They get religious freedom protections. And so people are using this as a workaround to say that, look, what I'm doing is a form of church service by providing these experiences to my parishioners. And, um, you know, each, each person or group that does this, they're going to have to decide how much they want to emphasize. These are our doctrines. These are be our beliefs. That is what the DEA is looking for. But again, the DEA actually is not legitimately qualified to be asking about that. Um, and this whole question of, well, of, is there healing involved? So is this a therapy or is it a religion? I think that that also is just a completely bogus argument. Um, and it does, there, there still is this emphasis on sincere religious belief. And so this is, this is going to be a hurdle for people of, um, articulating, well, what is it that yes. you believe? And, um, that, it's still, I, I think it's limiting. I think it's, it's, it's opening up this area of making these experiences and services available to people that it wouldn't otherwise be available and give at least a veneer of legal protection around that, which as we've said, most of them have not been tested in court. But one of the ironies of the whole thing that I have been pointing out for a while now is that I do think it's a little bit ironic that the more beliefs you can make up about a psychedelic, the more likely you are to have your uh, right to take it be protected by the government versus someone who says, well, I don't have any beliefs. I'm just interested in the experience and what it gives me as an individual. Um, so in other words, like in the, you know, like I mentioned, I did participate in the Santo Daime church for about a year and a quarter. And there's a lot of doctrine in there and there is an indoctrination process and that they are very clear about what their beliefs are versus what their beliefs aren't and like like i mentioned the belief that daime is not actually ayahuasca whereas from the constituent component aspect of it it's absolutely ayahuasca but they say well we put a spirit in there which you know you're not going to find that in any court you can't open it up and like oh yeah look there's the spirit it's, it's in there they put it in there so this is definitely not ayahuasca um that it that it's ironic that if you can make up a bunch of stuff and say oh yeah well i believe that this has got all this you know and i'm sorry i mean that is my opinion that religion is a made-up thing um, religion is not quote unquote real. I do not believe that any religion is true or correct or real. Uh, religion is all an expression of the human ego asking the question of who am I? Where am I? What is this? Who's in charge? What am I supposed to do? What's important? That is, those are the questions that religion answers for people. Yeah, um, I think it's, I, I think it's super fascinating. Um, again, because you're right, well, what is a religion? What are your beliefs? What if they change? Um, yeah. Especially in, in the world of entheogenics, since, since um, you know, we, we've talked and since reading your material, and maybe next time we can get into it a little bit, you know, you're, you correct me if I'm wrong, like your, your perspective is we are one, we are everything, there's no reincarnation, there's nothing outside of ourselves. 
Um, ever since we've had that conversation, I've been working adamantly to disprove that unsuccessfully yet, but I'm still working on it. So we'll, we'll circle awesome. back um, because a lot of us, we don't want that to be the case, right? We don't want that to be the case. We're looking for it. So I find that interesting that um, your background is religious studies. And I guess that was one of the questions that somebody wrote in. Um, and, and again, feel, you don't have to share anything you don't want. But if you went in with this religious studies background after your first 5MO experience, what was the number one, and it didn't have to do with religious studies, I guess, what was your, they're asking, what, what did you notice after your first experience? What was the big aha after your personal first experience, if you're open to sharing that? Well, um, really, it was just this direct and immediate sense of like, oh, shit, I guess God is real. But with, with the, the um, corollary that this unitary consciousness and being that I've just experienced myself as, having studied all these different religions, not a single one of them is accurately describing what I just experienced. Yes. That there are some of them that are closer than others, but there's not a single one that is actually true and correct. So this didn't convert me it, if anything, it converted me away from any religion. Uh, the closest that I was to any religion was Zen Buddhism at the time. And um, I quickly came out of that with, um, you know, as you mentioned, like, oh, if I'm God, and again, I mean what I really am. I don't mean Martin. I don't mean this person. Like, don't mistake me when I say I'm God. I'm not trying to proclaim, it's me, everybody. It's not you, it's me. I'm not saying that. Um, that if I was this unitary consciousness and being, then the whole notion of individual reincarnation and karma is clearly a projection of the ego. It's not a real thing. Because if I'm God and God is everyone and everything, that means I'm everyone and everything right now. I'm everyone and everything that ever will be. And I'm everyone and everything that ever has been. And there is no, there's no Martinness that's going to leave this body and go into some other body at some point in the future. And whatever makes me, me didn't come from a previous incarnation of me because it's just the universal consciousness that is peeking out of everyone's eyes simultaneously. So it quickly disabused me of any of my proto-religious uh, leanings and feelings. Um, and that also, that was a very curious position to come from because, you know, as probably as many of the, your listeners are, I was a self-identified spiritual seeker. I was looking for, well, what what is true? And maybe this is true. And maybe the Buddhists really know what they're talking about. Or maybe the Hindus really know what they're talking about. Or, you know, um, I mean, I was pretty firm that, you know, Christians, they didn't know what they were talking about, but that was my own biases um, anyway. Um, but I came out of it with a sense of being a, a, an intellectual non-dualist to what I would describe as being an embodied non-dualist, which is very, very different, that we can develop an intellectual understanding of something such as non-duality, but that's not the thing in and of itself. You know, the map is not the territory. The description is not the experience itself. And there is no substitute for the direct experience. And that conclusion also became very, very clear. And also that 5-MeO-DMT is profoundly unique. There is yes. nothing else like it. No, it, um, and, and, and to your point, um, even the experience that I've, I've had, um, again, there's always that once you're back online, it's still being interpreted through the ego. So that's where the slippery slope is with folks, yeah. right? You have this experience and I've done it enough to realize that. So I'm not clinging to it, um, but I'm hoping I'm wrong. I'm looking for, for something else, but I'm more on the same page as you. So, so that being said, it's interesting. We both do integration. I'm sure you work with um, people that have come that maybe have like a therapist or a coach or, or things like that. And especially in the, the new spiritual community, um, how would you answer or deal with a, a client that comes to you that says my, my therapist says my issues are from a past life past life trauma so what do you how would you summarize what do you think past life trauma is yeah um there i would i would want to redirect them actually to just looking at their life now that um first of all it, i think it is interesting that um 
yeah, there have been people who come to me who say, oh, well, my facilitator said that this was past life stuff. And it's interesting how often that is imposed from someone else onto someone who says, oh, this is your past life stuff. It's not the person themselves saying, I think this is my past life stuff. It's their, it's their facilitator who is interpreting this. And I would just, I would first of all say, well, what makes you think that your facilitator knows what they're talking about? You know, what, why is there a reason that you would agree with that or not agree with that? And at best, if somebody does have a past life experience in some capacity, that what I like to try and do is help them frame that as, okay, we don't need to take this literally as a past life. Um, because all, in my view, all past lives are your past lives. But there's something about this particular configuration of experience that is somehow resonating or mirroring your current reality or your current experience. So even if we want to take it as this is informing you in some way, it's not that it's going to inform your identity, like, oh, I was this person, this is me. But how is this experience that this past life had, how is that informing your current experience of being you? In other words, how does it relate to your life now? Um, and so that we can look at it through um, sort of that transpersonal lens in a sense that maybe this is some kind of archetype that you're resonating with in some way, or maybe it's it's relating to your current relationships that you have in some way. So it's always about no matter what the topic is, even if people want to talk about aliens and space stations and the other world, it always comes back to, well, how are you being right here, right now? How are you dealing with living in 3D reality as the embodied being that you are? And if you're living too much in your mind and your projections of other worlds and other realities and past lives, you are um, dissociating from your lived experience right here and now. So it's always about helping to bring people back into the present moment, into their lives, into their bodies, and then asking them, so how are you doing at being you here and now? Are you able to love yourself? Are you able to give yourself permission to be yourself, to feel your heart, to live from that place? And if not, then all the multiple realities and spirits and past lives, it's just a form of masturbation. You know, it's just a way of playing with yourself and giving yourself to project onto, to create meaning and significance. And, you know, it's like, a okay. So I do know someone who claims to have been some kind of Oracle priestess back in ancient Egypt. And she kind of makes a career out of that, you know, so it becomes for a lot of people, um, you know, it becomes a way of creating their identity. They say, oh yeah, I was this. And so that makes me special. Right. Yeah. Most and, people aren't having past lives of Jim, the Mason that's making, you know, $9 an hour that nobody ever knew. It's always somebody important, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then even, you know, also when people talk about ancestors, like people talk about, you know, bring in your, call in your ancestors to help you. And especially when, you know, we're dealing with like white Americans, they're like, dude, your ancestors were probably Indian killers and slavers, like, you know, and religious fanatics, like what, like we always want to project some kind of ideal outside of ourselves, whether it's a religious figure or ancestors or spirits or past lives and use that to bolster our self image of who it is that we are and our sense of connection or whatever it is. But those are all just ego games. They're all just ways of creating your identity. So that's why I always like to bring it back to who are you right here, right now? And that's where, when we peel away the layers, if we can really get to the core of it, it's like, shit, I'm God. You know, that's the only thing that exists is this universal being in consciousness. And that's me and that's you and that's everything. And so we can just remove all the masks. You're like, okay, so that's great. You're a priestess, you're a shaman, you're a past live aficionado. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Oh, you're a Scorpio. Oh, you're you're a Sagittarius. Oh, you're a Taurus. Let's go deeper than that because those are all just surface phenomenon. Let's get to the core of it. And you know, that's what 5MEO did for me. It was like just get just right to the heart of the matter. No beating around the bush, no bullshit, no smoke and mirrors just here's reality guess what it's all one it's always been one always will be one nothing you can do about it get over it 
that's, you know, it, it, it's funny you say, because that's it. That's what it did for me. Um, you know, same thing. And it'd be fun. Maybe we could have a good time with it. I watch some other facilitations and not to critique and, and pick on other facilitations, like less they bring in things like the specialness, like I'm going to call in the spirit of the toad to help determine who I should serve first. I'm like, that's not only is that silly to me, number one, it's silly, but number two, I think it's, it's not helpful. A lot of the no. folks that I'm, I'm working with, it, it, it's to me, it's about empowerment, right? So anytime that we're pointing them outside of themselves, I think we're doing them a disservice. It's not within you. It's I've got the secret or this, or because of that, and kind of a simple analogy I use, like when I take my, my, I get in a car accident, I take to the auto body shop, the backstory is just brief, right? They don't need 20 minutes of like, yeah, they yeah. were texting and I don't know what happened that day. I had, it's like the fender's jacked up and this is broke. Let's, let's work on fixing that. That's, yeah. that's the problem now. But I find a lot of times we're, we're stuck in this story, yeah. but I, yeah, I watch facilitations on, on different medicines a lot. And I'm like, you maybe need um, some 5-MeO because you're kind of trapped in that, that, that surface level thought. Um, last question that somebody asked, and I, I think I know where we're going with this. We've had these conversations, but I'll let you run with it. Do you believe that there are dark entity, entities or energetic forces out there at play? For example, what do you think the shamans are doing when they are removing dark entities from people? Oh, they're, they're just objectifying a particular energy that happens to be residing within that person and they're anthropomorphizing it in some way and giving it a face and giving it a name. And sometimes that can be easier for people um, to, you know, to create a sense of separation and like, okay, this is a dark entity and it's been removed. And so now I feel better, but actually it was just you all along. So no, there are no, there are neither light nor dark entities. There are there's a whole variety of spectrums of energies that exist within our embodied experience and within our experience of consciousness. And some present as lighter, some present as darker, some present as more loving and comfortable, and some present as more difficult, challenging, dark, ugly. Um, but those are all just relative concepts. And that, yeah, from an embodied experience, um, you're going to experience some things that are really pleasant and you're going to experience a lot of things that are really unpleasant and really uncomfortable as part of the package of being. Um, but no, I don't believe that there are any disincarnate entities floating around out there, either waiting to help us or to fuck with us, that those are, those are projected meanings that are created by the human mind. And I, I think that this has really been overplayed in a lot of ways, because um, there's this great book that I read about Navajo philosophy, and it's called The Main Stock. And um, this was written like back in the 1990s. And um, the anthropologist who wrote this book, he said, one of the greatest um, misinterpretations of native cultures is that outsiders think that all natives are fundamentalists. So they think that when they're talking about spirits and entities that they think, oh, isn't it cute? These natives really believe in all these spirits and entities. And he said, you know, if you actually talk to any Navajo, they'll tell you this is not, it's not a belief. This is the way that we talk about how healing is accomplished, how illness is experienced. But ultimately, these are metaphors that when we talk about spirits, we're not literally talking about spirits. We're not, and that yes, sometimes they present that way, but just because something seems like it's something doesn't mean that it is that thing. And so that indigenous cultures actually have a lot more sophisticated nuance. But when we as outsiders go and participate in this, and then it's like, oh, well, the natives believe in the spirits. So I believe in the spirits too. And these spirits are totally real. Um, and it's not to say that some indigenous cultures don't have a, you know, a more solid ontological belief around what spirits are, but it is to say that there's a deep, deep problem of translation that's present. And that when things are uncritically adopted from one culture to another, there often is a loss of translation that takes place. And that most often what we do is we try and find things that fit our preconceived notions about what's real and what's not real. And then we reconfigure it into our own thing. And, you know, I think a great example of this is the whole complete nonsense that was 2012. I mean, everyone's talking about, oh, Mayan calendar. And it's like, it's the end of the world. And like all this profound shift in consciousness. That was all just apocalyptic Christianity repackaged as new age fluff. 
there was nothing indigenous there at all. Like you go talk to the Mayans, like those are your, does your calendar end? It's like, no, you just fucking turn the page, idiot. Like you just, it's a calendar, it rolls over, man. It's not the end of anything. Um, but we're doing that all the time and we're doing it uncritically and so uncritically that it gets worn as a badge of honor by a lot of people like, oh, well, I have thoroughly adopted this other culture's views. And it's like to really adopt another's culture's views and do it in a way that is even partially authentic is you really need to be participating within that culture. You need to be part of the culture because these are cultural languages. Um, then there's a certain fluency that happens within the cultural language, the way meaning is, is made and talked about and the way that power relationships are um, negotiated within a culture, you have to be embedded within it um, to really be able to participate in it. So for example, out at Mescalero, what they would tell me was like, look, you can, you can study our religion. They said, but you'll, you'll never really understand it because you're not Mescalero, you weren't raised here. And it would be really silly of you to go back to Santa Barbara. That's where I lived at the time. For you to go back to Santa Barbara and suddenly say, yeah, I believe in mountain spirits because Mescaleros believe in mountain spirits. Because they say, this doesn't have anything to do with you, man. This is our culture. This is how we talk about ecology. This is about how we talk about geography. This is how we talk about healing. This is how we talk about metaphysics and cosmology doesn't have anything to do with anybody who's not Mescalero. Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think um, the, the language now and just, you know, I call it the spiritual community. It's, it's very, it, it's very much like that, right? It's a, it's a lot of words and a lot of memes. I call them that they don't really, I'm like, have you experienced that? Or is that just something that you saw somewhere? Right. And yeah. we're just like, Oh, that's, what the ayahuasca era that served me, that's, I'm in, that's me now. Um, and uh, it, it's gotten, it's gotten tricky. Cause again, just being honest and compassionate with folks that are listening. It's like, I, I'm a lot of the folks that we're meeting or I'm meeting specifically are coming. They'll have one identity, Jim, the, the accountant, they'll maybe have a ceremony or two ceremonies. And now they they're, they're still Jim, the accountant, they just have more beads. They've traded yeah. one role for another role, but they think that they've changed. And it's like, you just shifted into another character. It's just got a different costume and you're using different language, but you're still attached to this, this role. And I think that's one of the, the powers of, of, of 5MEO, which kind of led us to the beginning of the conversation. You um, speak in a, a Solomon Fox and Entheogenesis. Yeah. If you want to share the details with that and, and, and also let folks know how they can get hold of you, ask a question, sign up for any of your integration, listen to your music, your books, please. Yeah. So the church is silent with ox and you can find them online. And I'm just going to quickly call up and Theo Genesis. Oh. Yeah, it looks like Saturday, April 15th and 16th from 1 yeah. to 2 p.m. Austin, Texas. Yeah. Yeah. And to get tickets is just in theogenesis.io. Um, is where you can get tickets online and you can also find they have a Facebook page for the Church of Silomathox and that's P-S-I-L-O that's you know the P for like psilocin and psilocybin so Silomathox and and uh, to find me online my personal web page is martinball.net and that's kind of my main hub and yeah as you mentioned um, I've got books I've got a lot of them uh, they're available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. I'm working on my 12th audiobook right now. It's what I was doing before we got on this call, and it's what I'm going to do as soon as we get off. Um, I'm also a musician and artist. You can find my music just under Martin Ball. And it's 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 a terrible irony, but there my music has been combined online with this other Martin Ball who made an album in 1995 called Come to the Throne, which is all Jesus praise and worship music. And so sometimes our music is like jammed together, which is just one of the terrible ironies of um, <laughs> internet life for me. Um, but I'm not, I'm not that guy. I'm the guy with all the other albums with psychedelic covers on it. Um, and uh, yeah, I do offer integration calls for people. And also I do work, you know, like yourself, I work with a number of facilitators and help uh, give feedback and, you know, direction or guidance when asked for. So I offer consultations with facilitators as well. And sometimes people who just want to talk about, well, what, 
what can I do to set up a church or whatever? Not that I'm a legal expert, but obviously I do have a lot of information in this field. So I deal with kind of people across the board on a personal independent basis. And that's a non-dual and theogenic integration.com if you want more info about that. And of course, I'm the host of the Entheogenic Evolution podcast, and you can find that wherever you can find podcasts. And as I like to promote these days that it's it's 15 years old, and I think I'm probably the longest currently running podcast about psychedelics uh, on the planet. So I'm not sure if I can really claim that title because I don't know every podcast in the world, but I know that the ones that were around when I started, they're not around anymore. So I think I'm probably the longest currently running podcast about psychedelics. So there you go. Wow. I love it. And I'm going to highly recommend your books, uh, any of his talks. Um, again, there's there's several on YouTube, but go and get the books, support the books. I've read several of the books. They're phenomenal. Um, I haven't gotten to the audio books yet, but that might be my, my next move. Easier to listen to when I'm driving. But uh, no, it's all been phenomenal information. And again, um, I don't say this egoically, but I've been doing this work for a while now, but I find you inspiring and um, just super positive. So I've been growing with our conversations. Um, and so I'd encourage other facilitators, folks, regardless of where you think you are at their stage in this, especially 5MEO, because we're still new in this, as far as I'm concerned. Anybody that thinks they've got that one figured out, we should have a conversation. Um, you know, it, it's there's the, the, the methods and mythologies behind it are continuing to evolve and change. But if you're in the field of any of these entheogens and you're just looking for a, someone to bounce some ideas off of, I highly recommend uh, Martin. So thank you for taking the time. If you guys get a chance, get down the Entheogenis, um, check it out. I think it may be live. I don't know if they're going to stream it. They may stream it as well. Um, but if you're in Austin, Texas, you have an opportunity to check it out. But um, I'll close this just to, to be safe. Neither of us are endorsing uh, endorsing Silomethoxin. Um, if that's something you choose to do, you do it on your own. I'm not saying yeah. it's right for anybody. Um, it's something that I did a lot of research on before I stepped into it, and I stepped into it safely, titration and and it, it works for me, but that is by far not an endorsement to anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other than that, anything you'd like to say in closing, sir? Oh, just thanks so much for having me on originally and having me back again. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Obviously, I'm a talker. I'm a share. I've got a lot to say, and I just appreciate the opportunity and appreciate you for everything that you're doing, Kirby. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it, and just really grateful for our connection and continued ongoing interaction. I appreciate you too. And uh, again, folk, uh, folks, check us out. Check out a site. Uh, get a book. And um, if all goes well, we'll make sure that we have them back here shortly. So thank you for listening. Awesome.